Nothing in the world was as mysterious as the huge ancient lion with the head of a human called the Great Sphinx of Giza. It was supposedly built around 2500 BC for Pharaoh Khafre. Yes, it's that ancient. Then the Sphinx got buried in sand. Then they tried to dig it out to admire it. It happened several times until the first modern archaeological excavations were attempted in 1817, though they didn't manage to reveal all the secrets of this statue. For example, there's a hole in the head of the Sphinx, and no one knows its purpose. A 16th century traveler wrote that a priest entered the head of the statue, and when he spoke, it was as if the Sphinx itself was speaking. Many New Kingdom stelae depict the Sphinx wearing a crown. If the crown actually existed, the hole could have been the anchoring point. Whatever the case, in 1926, the hole was closed with a metal hatch. That same year, the Sphinx was cleared of sand, and archaeologists suddenly discovered a mysterious tunnel at floor level at the north side of the rump. The discovery excited archaeologists and tourists alike, but the tunnel was soon covered with masonry veneer and almost forgotten. More than 50 years later, three elderly men who used to work nearby recalled the existence of the passage, and it was rediscovered in 1980. It's worth saying that the tunnel is quite unusual. It consists of an upper and a lower section, which are angled roughly 90 degrees to each other. Why? What was the purpose of this? One theory says the tunnel was dug by treasure hunters after the statue was built. That is, the main tunnel was cut from top to bottom, and then an additional hole was dug at the bottom. This actually could have happened back in times of ancient Egypt, because many ancient tombs were looted very quickly, and no one was afraid of any curses. Another theory suggests that this shaft of ancient origin is an exploratory tunnel or unfinished tomb shaft that sort of leads to nowhere. Why nowhere? The thing is, a seismic tomography scan of the statue revealed a void below the surface. The void, which reportedly measures 39 by 29 feet, is about 16 feet beneath the Sphinx. The discovery has caused a stir in the scientific community, as it may indicate that some unknown artifacts may be hidden under the cult statue. The place could have even stayed safe from treasure hunters. Although seismic tomography has been used to detect underground anomalies before, this particular void is remarkable for its size and location. Aside from this void, several other voids have been discovered in that area. It's believed that one of them represents something like an ancient library, which could contain valuable information about ancient Egyptian history and culture. There's one serious problem, though. Since the mysterious room is quite deep, it's most likely been flooded by groundwater. It comes up to 16 feet below ground level. Overall, the Sphinx is an amazing monument. It's considered one of the most recognizable statues in the world. But perhaps the Sphinx was not always the way we see it now. According to some researchers, its head was originally a lion's head, not a human one. Geologist Colin Reeder discovered that the Sphinx's body is much older than its head, suggesting that the statue's human features were added afterwards. Reader's theory is supported by other evidence. Turns out that the head and body of the Sphinx are disproportionate. This suggests that originally its head was not a human's, but a lion's head. Also, for the ancient Egyptians, lions were potent symbols of power. Scientists have even attempted to recreate exactly what the Sphinx looked like when it was built. However, these results require redating of the Sphinx to an earlier time, which is why Egyptologists are still reluctant to accept the theory in its entirety. Various secret passages are something ancient Egypt is very well known for, and the more advanced technology gets, the more we can learn about these passages. Take the Great Pyramid, for example. Thanks to advances in physics, scientists have been able to discover the enormous void hidden inside the famous pyramid. In 2016, an international team of scientists announced that they had discovered an empty space about 100 feet long. The purpose for which this space was created is unclear. Is it a chamber, a tunnel, a large gallery? Maybe no one intended to build it in the first place, and this is also a plausible theory. Most likely, the empty space served some engineering purposes, for example, helped to lessen the load on other known chambers of the pyramid. In short, we can only hope the technologies will keep evolving, and that in the future, we'll be able to look right through the stones and see what's inside. <laughs> And if you think that research on ancient Egyptian structures is going too slowly, then you're right. Figuring out a long-lost culture can be challenging, and it often gives birth to many weird theories. But we'll come back to them later. 
For now, let's talk about the Serapium in Memphis, which was an ancient burial place for sacred bulls. At least 60 animals were buried there over a time span of about 1,400 years. The sarcophagi for these bulls were made of solid stone and weighed up to 70 tons each. The process of selecting a new bull began with the death of the living one, and I must say that this sacred bull had a fabulous life. The animal was pampered and nurtured, but any bull inevitably died, and they prepared for its death in advance since a sarcophagus took quite a lot of time to make. As soon as the bull died, part of its body was consumed and the rest was mummified or otherwise preserved before finally being buried. The cycle went on again and again. This kept going until about 30 BC when worshipping of this sacred bull ceased as Roman rule was established in Egypt. When the Serapium was rediscovered, it became a true archaeological marvel and gave rise to a bunch of strange theories. For example, someone believes that the giant sarcophagi were intended for the burial of giant people because the ancient Egyptians simply couldn't spend so much time and effort for the sake of some bulls. Well, turns out they could. Because ancient Egyptians generally held animals in high regard. For example, archaeologists discovered an incredible cat necropolis at Bubastium, a temple complex dedicated to the feline goddess Bastet. The excavations revealed an unprecedented number of animals that had been mummified and left as offerings to the goddess. According to some accounts, literally thousands of feline mummies were wrapped in linen bandages and adorned with amulets depicting Bastet. North of Bubastium lies Anabion, a temple complex dedicated to Anubis, the jackal-headed god of death, where maze-like tunnels are estimated to hold millions of mummified dogs. In short, people in ancient times were quite successful in mummifying small embodiments of deities. In addition, the catacombs were once filled with mummified ibises, hawks, crocodiles, cobras, and even baboons. I think that the ancient Egyptians sometimes got so carried away they mummified anyone who wasn't fast enough to escape. But this, of course, had a sacred meaning, and the mummies served as offerings. It's easier to say which animals the Egyptians didn't mummify. As far as scientists know, there are no mummified pigs, hippos, and that's about it. But this custom had one peculiarity. The animal mummification industry was so great that people began to make fake mummies. Real mummies were expensive, the demand was huge, so the traders had to figure something out. Imagine how surprised modern researchers were when they used a CT scanner and an x-ray machine to look under the wrapping of the mummies and found that about a third of the mummies are empty inside. No skeleton or other stuff. Cats were actually quite lucky. The sacred ibis went extinct in modern Egypt, finished off by intense mummification. When animals in the wild began to die out, extensive breeding programs were launched in temples and surrounding villages. Some species were saved. But the very act of breeding animals just to mummify them later terrifies me. But let's leave the poor ancient animals alone. There are more interesting things to find in the tombs. What are the chances you discover a meteorite in the ancient tomb? Assuming, of course, you'd be willing to explore old tombs in the first place. A new study has revealed a remarkable discovery in an ancient Egyptian tomb. Beads crafted from a meteorite. The tube-shaped beads, estimated to be about 5,000 years old, were found in 1911 in a cemetery located about 40 miles south of Cairo. The beads found at the burial site represent the first known examples of iron used in ancient Egypt, thousands of years before the Iron Age. Scientists have long been suspecting that this iron has cosmic origins. Turned out that the beads were rich in nickel, a signature of iron meteorites, with modern research confirming that it was not an alloy but the material's original composition. Moreover, the researchers say that the beads have a distinctive crystal structure found only in meteorites. Most likely, the jewelry was included in the burial because of its rare beauty and assumed magical properties. To us, iron might seem familiar and dull, but for the ancient Egyptians, a thing that fell from the sky was definitely something special. And it's not the only time ancient Egyptians used meteoric iron. The discovery of the iron dagger in Tutankhamun's tomb once again confirmed the theory that the Egyptians extracted the metal from meteorites. Until recently, it was believed that the ancient Egyptians were not particularly skilled in producing iron objects until about 500 BC. Archaeological evidence suggests that iron was rarely mined in the Nile Valley compared to other materials such as copper. When Pharaoh Tutankhamun died, iron was a rarer material than gold. Actually, this makes sense. 
To get iron, one has to put in a fair amount of effort and use special tools, which apparently simply didn't exist in ancient Egypt. Both Egypt and the Sinai Peninsula had large supplies of iron ore, and textual sources indicate that the Egyptians were aware of the metal. I mean, they'd always known about it from early in their history. But the ore was mainly used to create pigments for art and makeup. Scientists used to believe iron was not used for more conventional purposes like crafting weapons. That changed, however, when a dagger found in Tutankhamun's tomb was analyzed by experts. The analysis showed that much of the metal in it came from meteorites and not from ore deposits. As I said, iron from meteorites had a higher value as a metal that came from somewhere above and was clearly worthy of becoming a pharaoh's dagger. Speaking of Tutankhamun, there's much to discuss about this pharaoh. You've probably heard about him. Tutankhamun's funerary gold mask is considered one of the most recognizable symbols of ancient Egypt. In addition, his tomb, discovered in 1922, was virtually untouched by looters and therefore proved to be very rich. The discovery of his tomb has been called one of the greatest archaeological events of all time. Tutankhamun's tomb is also believed to be linked to the famous Curse of the Pharaohs, which allegedly killed the archaeologists who disturbed the peace of the ancient king. Of course, this is just a myth, but that's not the point here. Among other treasures, six chariots of different sizes were found in Tutankhamun's tomb, which deserve a title of the Ferrari of antiquity. The chariots were the latest technological advancement of the time. The wheels alone are impressive. They feature a real tire made of a flexible wooden rim. Also, the six-spoke wheels are made from elastic wood. This ensured that loads transmitted by uneven ground were absorbed evenly and dampened by the wheel. It's almost like intelligent suspensions in modern cars, only designed 3,300 years ago. The scientists who studied the chariots are certain their wheels were as tolerant to damage as an airplane. Yes, I'm not quite sure what that means either, but that's exactly what the scientists said. All these features ensure a remarkable level of softness and comfort. Even at a speed of about 25 miles per hour on the uneven ground of Egypt, the chariots of Tutankhamun were easy to handle and pleasant to ride. There's only one thing, though. As we know, Tutankhamun died at a very young age, when he was about 19 years old. There are different theories of what could be the cause of the pharaoh's death, from congenital diseases to malaria. Some scientists suggest that Tutankhamun died in a chariot accident because of numerous injuries, not to mention the absence of the front part of his chest wall and ribs. Of course, there's no certainty that the pharaoh lost these body parts because of the accident, it's quite possible that they were simply stolen by robbers when they stole jewelry from the tomb. But back to the chariots. In ancient Egyptian times, they were not only a means of transportation, but also one of the deadliest weapons. And weapons had to be produced in large supplies. So Pharaoh Ramses II had an entire factory for that. It functioned kind of like a modern tank factory. The first assembly line, as we know it today, was used at the Ford factory in 1913. But it seems that the Egyptians were far ahead of modern people in this regard. Chariot parts arrived at the factory separately, then went through a series of workshops where they were fitted together, and the end result was a fully functional chariot ready for battle. It's no coincidence that it was during the reign of this pharaoh that the Battle of Kadesh took place, known as the largest chariot battle in the history of mankind. Between 5,000 and 6,000 chariots took part in it a quantity that could hardly have been produced if not for ancient factories. What else could they make in ancient Egypt? Prosthesis. And damn nice looking ones. Almost two decades ago, archaeologists working in the burial chamber of the necropolis of Sheikh Abd el Korna, west of Luxor, discovered something unexpected. An exquisitely crafted prosthetic big toe. It was attached to the remains of a woman and may be considered the earliest practical prosthesis ever discovered. According to the research, the prosthesis belonged to the daughter of a priest. However, given the quality of the prosthesis, the priest must have had a high social status. Using modern microscopy, x-ray technology, and computer tomography, scientists were able to determine that the wooden toe, which was created in the early 1st millennium BC, was refitted several times to exactly match the foot of its owner. Scientists have also documented the different materials and methods used to make the ancient prosthesis, the craftsman who created this device must have been well-versed in human physiology. The owner of the prosthesis probably died between the ages of 50 and 60 and had suffered a toe amputation at some point in the past. 
The absence of the toe may have been embarrassing for her, and therefore the prosthesis may have helped. Generally speaking, the fact that ancient Egyptians were good at medicine, well, for their time, is no secret. Ancient Egyptian medicine is the oldest recorded medical system. The ancient Egyptians are also widely known for their many accomplishments in mathematics, astronomy, and engineering. However, one of the most mysterious ancient Egyptian inventions may be the electric light bulb. Well, or something like that. I agree, it does sound like another conspiracy theory, but I've never heard this one before, so it got my attention. The dendrolite is the actual fragments of the reliefs of the Egyptian Hathor temple. According to the generally accepted theory of Egyptologists, it depicts the Egyptian creation myth, and the text on the sides only confirms this. In fact, it's a snake born from a lotus flower. Simple and clear symbols for ancient Egypt. But as is usually the case with ancient Egypt, there's an alternative point of view. According to it, the relief shows an ancient electric lighting device. No, really, it does look like a giant light bulb. And also, there's no soot on the walls of the tombs. Unfortunately, although the ancient Egyptians were good at technology, they didn't have enough time to invent electricity. If they had, archaeologists would have found fragments of glass, filaments, and other elements essential for the light bulb. But nothing of the sort was found. Another discovery that has excited conspiracy theorists is called the Saqqara Bird. It's a figurine made of sycamore discovered in 1898 during the excavation of one of the tombs. The bird was dated around 200 BC and is now housed in a Cairo museum. What are the most logical conclusions this discovery points to? Well, the bird must have had some ceremonial significance because the falcon, the bird after which the Saqqara bird is modeled, is an image of some of the most important gods of Egyptian mythology, most notably the falcon deity Horus and the sun deity Ra. Maybe it was a toy for some child of the ancient Egyptian nobility, or maybe the bird actually served as a beautiful weather vane, or a boomerang, or just an ornament. But for some reason, some believe that the bird may be evidence that principles of aviation were known centuries before they were discovered. Since then, several attempts have been made to reproduce the design of the ancient glider using modern materials and technology. The first attempt was unsuccessful. The designer was unable to make the glider fly because it was unstable. The second model proved to be more successful. It was modified with balsa wood used as the building material. The designer proved he could make the glider fly with a light push, even making it glide. Still, the discovery creates too much controversy, and Egyptologists rightfully refuse to accept bizarre theories. But at this point, you might say, wait a minute, what about those images of flying machines on murals? For decades, something in the temple of Pharaoh Seti I at Abydos has been firing the imagination of those who love all things mystical. Some of the hieroglyphs allegedly depict something that looks like a helicopter, as well as airplanes and a submarine. Some believe that these hieroglyphs prove there were modern technologies in antiquity, and that knowledge may have been given to Egyptians by aliens, or Atlanteans, or someone else. Most archaeologists, however, concur that there's nothing unusual about these images. Examples of ancient technology appeared because pharaohs had a habit of erasing the names of their predecessors and writing their own names on top. I'm not even kidding, it was quite a common practice. Imagine this, you're a pharaoh and you want to be admired. Your father started building a temple and then he died. You have to finish the construction, but on the most visible place of the temple, every visitor can read your father's name, not yours. You have to admit, it's kind of frustrating. So the pharaohs ordered the inscriptions to be changed, and the fact that they were carved in stone didn't stop anyone the images that can be mistaken for modern machines are merely the result of superimposing some inscriptions on others. And there's a reason I mentioned aliens. Ancient Egypt is a fertile ground for alien theories. A video uploaded to one of the YouTube channels dedicated to UFOs shows a crowd of tourists looking towards the pyramids while three bizarre triangular objects hover above them. The subtitles say the video was filmed in April 2016 and UFOs were present for four hours. Those who believe in mysticism claim the video is real because it's pretty high quality compared to other videos that allegedly show alien ships. But hey, technology doesn't stand still and computer graphics are far more advanced today than they used to be several decades ago. How about the theory that says the ancient Egyptians used the pyramids as power rods? Yeah, who cares about the tombs of pharaohs? 
Let these giant structures serve as the parts of an ingenious mechanism that allowed them to communicate with the gods. And the gods, of course, came from the stars, as they should. For some reason, obelisks always get a lot of attention here. They were often made of granite and then placed in front of temples, palaces, and other public buildings. Don't forget the quartz inside the granite. It's believed to create incredibly well-defined frequencies when you hit them mechanically. Quartz can be activated electrically. So what does that mean? Some people actually believe that quartz can be used to transmit certain signals right up there into space to reach the gods. The ancient Egyptians probably had no idea their distant descendants would come up with ideas like that. I think at this point, you're probably wondering why exactly the ancient Egyptians are surrounded by so many myths. Why it's them who are constantly mentioned in relation to UFOs or search for some highly advanced civilizations. Why is there a whole bunch of conspiracy theories around ancient Egypt in the first place? After all, we have ancient Rome, China, and Maya civilization. Well, the thing is, the technologies of the ancient Egyptians are well known, and they're also truly amazing. I've already mentioned some of them. You must agree they're amazing enough as they are without any bizarre theories. Take at least the pyramids. It's difficult for a modern person to believe that people were able to build something so complicated in ancient times and also huge. After all, they didn't have dump trucks, cranes, or concrete mixers. Nothing of the sort. Nevertheless, they managed to build the pyramids. Was it possible to do that without the help of extraterrestrial civilizations? Let's look at the Great Pyramid. It was supposedly built by producing approximately 2.3 million large blocks with a total weight of 6 million tons. Most of the blocks were cut nearby, right out of the Giza Plateau. Other blocks were delivered by boat down the Nile. White limestone from Tura for the casing and granite blocks from Aswan weighing up to 80 tons for the construction of the king's chamber. All in all, we arrive at the following figures. 5.5 million tons of limestone, 8,000 tons of granite, and 500,000 tons of mortar. This is a damn lot of heavy stuff. Keep in mind the stones not only had to be transported but also somehow quarried and the entire construction had to be completed fairly quickly. Otherwise, it would have turned out awkward. The pharaoh's dead, and there's nowhere to put him. To understand how the ancient Egyptians managed to build the pyramids, the stonemason Frank Burgos conducted an experiment using the tools of the ancient Egyptians and the materials available back then. Turned out that about 3,500 workers could produce 250 blocks a day needed to complete the Great Pyramid in 27 years. Does this sound plausible? Quite so. Pharaoh Khufu clearly lived long enough to see the end of the construction, although we don't know much about it. A 1999 construction management study by Egyptologists showed that the entire project required an average workforce of about 13,200 people, and a peak workforce of roughly 40,000. And no, all these people were not slaves, as previously thought. This, by the way, is the fault of the ancient Greek authors. They were not present during the construction, of course but they could make stuff up that sounded quite believable. However, efficient construction required professionals who couldn't work well when forced, rushed, or supervised, and modern research confirms this. It's true that there was no money of any kind in ancient Egypt at that time, but according to the scientists, there was something to pay with for the construction of the pyramids. Most likely it was food, including some cattle. Well, builders could also be exempted from paying taxes, which also worked for them. Of course, there are still disputes about the technology of construction, but they all mainly concern the methods of moving and placing the stones. Some even try to make copies of the pyramids, and the result is usually not very good. But keep in mind that there were professionals working on the ancient construction site who knew how to handle all these ancient tools. Even the coolest modern builders would require a long time to achieve the same level of skill. So, I won't go into detail about all the possible scientific theories and alleged methods of construction, because building and exploring the pyramids is a topic one could discuss endlessly. The debunking of myths alone would require a separate video. I will only say that modern theories of how the pyramids were built sound quite plausible. Except for those claiming aliens were involved in the construction, of course. See you later.